Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Amen. If you would, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. We'll be hanging out there today. And for anyone who does want the full notes, you can go to calvarydover.org forward slash grow. I'll have to do some trimming because of our time together at the altar and worship, which was great. Not a problem. I can do some trimming on my sermons. Hang tight, though, because I don't want to miss out on the good stuff, which, by the way, I don't write anything down I don't think is important to say (laughs) or good to say. Uh, But... We're in our series right now on the road to the cross, and on his way to the cross, Jesus garnered a reputation and a title, and it was an interesting one, called Friend of Sinners. Friend of Sinners. And that's our title for today's message. Now, the reason why he got this title was because he, hang out, he hung out with, or at least ate and sat with, sinners. That's because he came to save us. The reason uh, he got this, though, wasn't just because of that, but also because the critical and judgmental Pharisees gave him this title. Uh, as they watched him hang out with Matthew, the tax collector, or... Uh, People like the woman at the well who had multiple husbands or the woman caught in adultery to to Zacchaeus, uh, to the woman who anointed his feet with her tears, who was uh, apparently a a prostitute in the community. Uh, These are the people that Jesus was around and uh, he, he ate with them, he sat with them, but he did not sin with them. Just wanna make sure we say that in the beginning. The Pharisees assumed and judged that he was like them, but he wasn't. They were intimidated by his ministry and his authority and his power and abilities. And so they found any way to shame him and to make him look bad. But Jesus was not afraid to have that reputation because he knew his mission was to save these people from their sin. The reason why they were so receptive of Jesus is because no one was showing them this kind of mercy and love the way Jesus was. The leaders, the religious leaders, did their best to stay away from people. Jesus did his best to pursue people because he wanted to call them to repent and turn from their sins and live a new life. And he would save them to do that. And so that's why he got that title. And that's, I'm, I'm going fast through the beginning of my sermon to help with time. But I want you to know this. The, the woman that came to Jesus' feet, she actually came to his feet at a dinner with the Pharisees. So Jesus even ate with the Pharisees. But they didn't see themselves as sinners. They were self-righteous. So I just want to make sure we understand that. Now, why would Jesus do this as well? The Bible says his kindness leads us to repentance. His kindness leads us to repentance. It was his kindness and mercy that he showed them that made them realize that they need to change and come back to God. Now, he, he addressed the Pharisees multiple times on their judgmental, self-righteous, prideful attitudes. But there's nothing more beautiful than the three stories the parables that he shared in Luke 15. And so I want to break those down to you and then help us apply them. Luke 15, and we're going to start with verse 1, and this, this is his confrontation with them. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So Jesus told them this story. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. 
When he arrives, he will call together his friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. That's the heart of God. Now, shepherds were well known, especially in Bethlehem, and Jesus referred to himself as a shepherd as well. But shepherds would be vigilant at keeping an eye over their sheep, and when one would go away, they would go find it to make sure it was okay. And by the way, we, we are the sheep in this story. <laughs> we're silly sometimes. We walk away when we shouldn't. Now, at, at the same time in this culture and community, flocks were also communal. So there would be more than just one shepherd, technically, in real life. There would be multiple shepherds looking over, um, many times, a communal amount of flock from other owners. And so it may be that they would secure all the sheep they have right there in the wilderness, and then one would go and leave and find the one, uh, or they would bring them back to their village, the, the 99, so to say, and one shepherd would stay out looking. So it wouldn't be uncommon for this to happen, and it wouldn't be uncommon also for a village or a town to see a shepherd walking in from the hills with a sheep on his shoulders because he found the one. And what they would do is they would throw a party and celebrate the whole town because they found their livelihood. And these sheep were precious to them. This is a picture of God and his love for us. You are precious to God. Our lost neighbors and friends and coworkers are precious to him. He, it's not that he doesn't care about us if he goes and looks for them. It's just that we're okay. We're in the sheep pen. We're ready. We have, he, he's looking over us and keeping us safe and protected. But when someone's gone, someone needs to do something about it. And that's what Jesus did. See, the Pharisees could care less if people were lost and hurting in their sin. Jesus did the opposite. He pursued those who were lost and hurting in their sin. That's the heart, and that's what Jesus is using this story to do. And he goes on to say a similar story with the lost coin. Verse 8 says, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and sweep the entire house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Uh, a coin was, a silver coin like this would be a day's wages, but it wasn't just the value of the coin that was important. Uh, historically, there would also be headdresses of silver coins linked together by a silver strand and so the bride would have saved up for years or the family would have saved up for years to have this beautiful headdress on her wedding day with 10 coins in it. And so when one went missing, it was like almost losing your wedding ring. And so he's saying, wouldn't you shine a light and, and find that coin? And when you do, you celebrate. It's the same thing in our world. Jesus came into our dark world and shined himself. He is the light of the world. And he came in here and he was looking for you and me in this dark world to rescue us. Now this would blow away the Pharisees because their view of God would be that we come to God and do all we can to get to God and then do what we're supposed to do like the sacrifices and then God would show pity on us just, this is a new teaching that Jesus would go search for them. This is new, that, that, that God would go and look for us in this dark world. That's why we celebrate Christmas, Emmanuel, God with us. He came into this world living in the flesh through his son, Jesus Christ, to save us. That's the message that in the heart of God in the coin. To make it more personal, he uses a father-son relationship. So let's go to verse 11. <clears throat> to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. So this is an inheritance that would belong to the older son and then to the younger son. The older son would usually get more. The younger son would get less. And basically, when this, this young son 
said, I want this inheritance now, you could almost equivalent to, he was saying, um, I, I, I see you as dead, you're dead to me, can I have my inheritance now? At the same time though, it wouldn't be uncommon as well for fathers to distribute their wealth even before they die, so it may not be that. But I have to, I have to wonder, isn't that kind of how the world has treated God? God's dead to me, he doesn't exist, he's not alive, so let me go live however I want to live. That is the world that we live in. And let me explain that more by going to verse 13. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money and wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. Uh, Jews did not touch pigs. That was to be contaminated, to be unholy. He is so desperate. He is so humble by his circumstances. At this point, he's willing to even be close and even eat from the same trough as pigs would eat from. You know, God will put you through some humbling to get your attention. You know that, right? He will allow you to be a shell of a man and a shell of a woman until the only place you do is look back to the Father. Look back to God. And we need to be aware of that. He, he's, a, he's a jealous God in a good way. He's your creator. He loves you. He doesn't want you, as we heard from the uh, word today, from the body. By the way, we're, we're a Pentecostal church that believes in the operation of the spiritual gifts. And so someone gave a word from the Lord, or someone, someone prayed in the spirit, in tongues, and someone gave an interpretation of that tongues is what we believe happened. And it's spot on to our message today. It's spot on to next week's message that we can't live, have one foot in the world and one foot in God. You're not, you're gonna, you're gonna end up serving one of those gods. We hope it's God, but you have to be all in with God. Amen. Well, sometimes God will allow you to be humbled this much until you get your foot out of the world and come back to him. And that's his love, not his torture or his punishment. That's his love. Because at least you're still alive. And at least you still have time to turn. Verse 17 says, when he finally came to his senses, realized what he had done, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So this is his repentant heart. He's rehearsing it, so to say, before he gets home. He is having a change of heart, change of mind. That is what we define as repentance two weeks ago. So to, to show his true heart of repentance, what does he do? He starts heading home, physically showing it. So as he returned home to his father, uh, so he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Can I stop there for a moment? I love that. That's a loving God. Why? He's looking for his son every day. Looking upon the horizon, waiting to see the silhouette of his son's body and gait and the way he walks, and he sees him far, long away in the distance because he's always looking upon us because he loves us. That's what Jesus is saying here. If his eye is on the sparrow, you know his eye is upon you because he loves you. I don't know how, where you've been in your life online or in this room. I don't know how far you've gone from God. I don't know how, how much you've done let me tell you something. The love and mercy of God is looking upon you. He's not trying to strike you dead. He's trying to save you. He's trying to save you. <laughs> Filled with love and compassion, we continue in verse 20, he ran to his son. <laughs> That's something the Pharisees wouldn't do or expect God to do. Run to the sinner? No way. They gotta come back here and beg for my mercy. 
My son, if he did that, he has, that is not how God treats us. He runs to his children. He embraces him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned. So there is the confession out loud to God or to the father in this story. I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf that we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And so the party began. This is what happens when someone comes back to God. There is a party in heaven for just one person. One person. What he was doing here is the father, by the way, some Greek manuscripts um, leave out the part where the son says, take me as a servant because they believe that other manuscripts also show that, that the father interrupts him before he says that, and he begins to clothe him as a son instead of a servant. Let me tell you something. When you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become a child of, the, of God, of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. You are a child of God. You are not a servant of God. Now, the cool thing is, is Paul and many others, even myself, I will view myself as a servant of God, but first I am a child of God, and then I love to serve my Lord and Savior. I love to give him my life because of what he gave for me. Now, this should have been great, but remember, who is Jesus confronting and talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees, the judgmental, prideful, critical, religious teachers of the day. This is their part of the story. This is... This is them in the story, and Jesus is confronting them. Verse 25 says, Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he was asked, and he asked one of his servants, What was going on? Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf, and we are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry. It wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, now, this tells you the heart of the Pharisees. Jesus is exposing the heart of the Pharisees, okay? All these years, I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. So he's upset. Now, there's two things to point out here. One he viewed his relationship with his father as a servant or a work-based relationship rather than a love-based relationship. He was doing these things out of duty rather than out of love. Just so you know, God doesn't want your duty. He wants your heart. It's when we give him our heart that we will do everything. We'll give him everything. We'll have both feet in God. So he's revealing that this is what the Pharisees are like. They just did all these things because they felt like they had to. They didn't do it out of love for their God. And the second thing is, no one mentioned specific sins until the Pharisee or their older brother said prostitutes. This is also consistent with what they did with all the people that Jesus hung out with. They called them by their sin, but Jesus calls you by your name. It shows the, the condemnation that comes from the critical, prideful people and then the love and grace and truth that comes from Jesus. Because don't forget, when that adulterous woman was in front of him and they were ready to stone her, and he said, he who is without sin be the first to cast a stone. Everyone had to drop their stones because they all sinned. And Jesus said, where are your accusers? They're not here and neither do I. But then he says this, now go and sin no more. So Jesus still says, do not sin. Just because he, he shows grace and mercy doesn't mean he's okay with us sinning. And we have to make sure we keep that in balance as we learn scripture and teach to our friends. So let's apply this to our lives. Uh, let me finish actually the story first. I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Verse 31, his father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. One more thing that God showed me 
in this text a few years ago that really has just blown me away. The older son was outside the home, and the home can represent uh, salvation and fellowship with God in the scripture, just being home with your father. Well, we see the older son is actually outside the home now, refusing to come in. See, Jesus is now evangelizing the Pharisees listening to him. Jesus is saying, come back. So even Pharisees are sinners. What we're trying to learn here is what we're learning is that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. We are all on equal playing field. We all need Jesus. And so now Jesus is showing them that the father is pleading for them to come back home because they're outside the house as well. Wow, it's powerful. So how do we apply this to us? Well, first of all, this is God's grace for you. This is his disposition towards you. If you're far from him, he's waiting with mercy. If you're far from him, he's pursuing you with mercy. He's seeking you out, trying to bring you home. I would suggest surrendering. You're not gonna find a love that will put up with you like God's love. And when you do realize that, you're gonna not want to keep doing the things you do or the old ways of life, and you're gonna be satisfied with what God has given you. We learn in this story as well that it's easier to come back to God than it is to come back to man, isn't it? That's not good in a way because we as a church need to be careful that when someone genuinely repents and comes back, we need to have open arms as well like God does. Amen. I think we're a little slow at that. We take our time a little more than God does maybe. I think we gotta be careful about not being too gracious and just saying, hey, yeah, you can do all those things and you just come here and you just, yeah, keep on living how you wanna live. Well, they're gonna read the Bible hopefully eventually and find out that's not true. So we gotta be careful that we don't look like we're lying. But at the same time, we as a church have been ridiculed and accused that God forgave me 10 years ago and I can't be forgiven yet by the church. That's a good point. So we need to learn to be like the father in this story who is represented as God. But I will highlight this. Notice that in each story of the parable, Jesus celebrates after they repent. Not before. See, Jesus doesn't celebrate your sin. He celebrates your repentance because that means you've seen it, you realize it's not good, and you've come home. That's when Jesus celebrates. And we as a church need to be careful. We live in a world right now that's trying to blur the lines. And, we, and sometimes we're saying, we're, we're trying to love people so much that we're willing to almost or pretty much celebrate their sin and pat them on the back. I mean, Jesus never winked at these sinners. He called them to repentance. And so we as a church, we have to learn that line. And you know what? You have to be okay with people disagreeing with you too. Oh, I don't want to get into that because we got to get out of here eventually, but. Oh, Lord. Love does not equal acceptance of all things. Love does not equal excusing whatever you do in your life because we love you. That is actually not an accurate definition of God's love. Love leads into all truth. Love would say, turn away from those things and come find out what's even better than all the things that you've learned. That's what love would do. And when you love someone enough, you're willing to tell them the truth and be okay if they disagree with you. There's, there's definitely that teaching in our world, this philosophy that if you truly love me, you will be okay with, with my choices and my decisions and lifestyles. Um, that's a lie from the devil. So we need to be careful, amen? 
Um, I disagree with things because I love people. And I want them to spend eternity with God. And I can't force them, though, to. And I don't, I don't try to force people to come back home. That's the key. The father didn't. He waited. And in other scriptures, we see that Jesus pursued. But he never made people believe in him. It was a choice. He never made people repent. It has to be a decision on your own. He's just going to show love and kindness, and so are we. So let me get to that next point. Showing grace to one another. Jesus wasn't the one throwing out the labels the Pharisees were. Jesus built bridges, not barriers. The Pharisees built barriers. They burned bridges. And the problem with that is, and this is the, this is the case in point where the bridge was available to come home for the prodigal son, is that if we show mercy and, and we stand in the truth that that is not okay and it is wrong, and we stand there waiting at least we still have a bridge open where they can come home. But unfortunately, in our world, there are people that have experienced such condemnation from Christians and such judgment that they don't even feel like they can come back home. And that's what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees made them feel so small and so, so bad and like they were diseased because they would never go near them. They would insult them. They would label them these terrible names, notorious sinners, instead of calling them by name. And so they didn't feel like they could come back if they, were, if they were sorry for their sins. And so we as believers have to make sure that we show mercy, but also stand with what is true and just say, I'm here for you if, you if you're ready to come back. I'm here for you if you see it. I love you no matter what. I don't agree with that, but I'm here waiting for you. Why am I taking so much time on this? Because I still run into families not knowing how to handle these things. And I, I really want us to, to understand that we should not burn bridges. We just have to say, look, you know where I stand, son. You know where I stand, daughter. You know where I stand, friend, neighbor, whatever it is. No matter what, I'm going to love you, but I have to stay here on this position. And I'm waiting with arms wide open if you need me. And I'm praying for you every day. That's love. It takes love to pray for people. That's love. And then we have to guard ourselves against becoming a merciless, critical Christian. When, when Jesus was confronted about being around Matthew, the tax collector, this is what he told them. He told the Pharisees this, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. And then he added, now go and learn the meaning of the scripture, quote, I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. They were so diligent at keeping the sacrificial system and all the laws that they would negate showing mercy to someone in need. Jesus, on the other hand, was faithful to keep the law, but also to show love and mercy to the worst sinners, as we see in scripture. And he was saying there, you're really good at doing these things, but you're not doing so well on the showing love and mercy around you. They became so critical about everyone around them and so good at pointing out sins that they weren't seeing that they were supposed to help them come to God as teachers of the law. The older brother wasn't celebrating because he was too busy condemning, criticizing, and complaining. Now, I told the first service, this is the hard part of the message. And God's email is god at heavenly.com. Uh, There's signs, we can pick up on signs if we're becoming like the Pharisees. Uh, we can forget what it's like to be lost. Don't forget what it was like before Christ. It was hard. It was hopeless. It was, you needed someone to help you. You needed someone to pray for you. This is what happens. We become like this when we neglect the mission. When we neglect going out and reaching people and we're only focusing on our own spiritual walk and we should, we need to do both. We need to grow, but we need to help other people find Jesus, amen? 
And when we're not following Jesus outside these walls or outside our personal walk, we're missing the heart of God. They missed the heart of God here. They, the Pharisees knew the scripture inside and out and they were missing the point to show mercy to these sinners and to call them back to God. And so sometimes we can get so focused on ourselves that we forget the mission of Christ. And instead of looking for something wrong with people, let's be merciful and say, I'll help you. I'll be by your side. This is why I keep teaching disciple making. Let's be a disciple who follows Jesus and helps other people meet and follow Jesus as well. Let's, let's not go, man, they're all doing these things wrong and we're, out, we're outside. We're outside going, man, look what they're doing again. Ah, they make, ah, they drive me nuts. Don't they know that's wrong? No. <laughs> to be honest with you, we're post-Christian, post-church world. We, we, are living on, we are living with people whose kids have been raised outside of the Bible, outside of the church. They have no idea what they're doing is wrong. But we're over here being critical as Pharisees because we got it all set and we think we're all perfect and there's people out there that have no clue that they're lost and they need guidance. This is the people that Jesus was confronting. I mean, I, I have a reason to live tomorrow because I know people that don't know Jesus. I have a reason to read my Bible tomorrow, amen. I have a reason to be kind at the grocery store, kind at the pump, <laughs> kind everywhere. Because kindness leads us to repentance. Jesus was confronting these Pharisees who were lost in their own sin and pride and they couldn't see it. And there's another sign, by the way, and this is the part, you know, that could hurt too. There's another sign that when we become inward focused, we begin to complain about the church too much, whether it's the body or whether it's the actual church organization like here on Route 10. And meanwhile, we criticize and evaluate churches so much, but we haven't evaluated our own life as the church. And let me, let me give a few things that I would say to make sure you check yourself on before being too critical of churches. One, are you praying for the church? Are you praying for the leadership? Are you evangelizing? Are you reading your word and not waiting for the pastor to teach you the word? Are you showing love to those outside this church? Are you giving? Are you serving? You see what I'm saying? We have to be the church way before we come to church, before we start criticizing the church and being like a Pharisee. Like I said, email is God at, just kidding. So let me close with this story. And I have more notes in here on what defines someone as lost and how do we evangelize like Jesus did. And I just have a little too much today. But I want, I want you to hear this story because this is God's heart for you and me. And this is God's heart for those outside these walls. All right? I heard a story of a family living on a farm in the Northern California gold country. Their only son lived a good life, but as he grew up, he was introduced to drugs and, made, and it made its way through the nearby school. Upon graduation, the drugs took a major toll and the family didn't know what to do. There were many arguments and the parents were at their wits end. The father, rightfully concerned that his son may steal his rainy day funds and some savings, hit a significant amount in his barn. The father didn't know that his son had found this stash. And a few weeks later, the parents couldn't find their son. They feared the worst. But dad checked his spot and all the money was gone. The son had hopped on the Sacramento River train heading south towards Los Angeles. It was in LA where he figured that he could live without limits, but his life would spiral even more out of control. In order to continue his addiction, he linked up with the local addicts and began to steal from cars and homes. One theft went terribly wrong when one of his accomplices brought a gun and shot a homeowner while he was on the lookout. This son found himself with a prison sentence as an, as an accessory to murder for five years. 
And while in prison, the son was humbled and got off drugs and met Jesus through a local church's prison ministry. Praise God. The son was overwhelmed with shame and guilt and never had the courage to speak with his parents, but only wrote one letter to let them know what he had done and where he is. Two years had passed, and a judge reduced the son's sentence. The son had a difficult decision. Go home or start a new life somewhere. The prison chaplain shared the prodigal son story with this young man, and so he had an idea. Right before he was released, he sent a long letter home confessing everything he did and apologizing for all the grief and harm he had caused their family. His home sat on a hillside along the railway where he could see in a distance from the train. In the letter, he asked his parents to hang one bed sheet on the clothesline if he was forgiven and allowed to come home. He figured he could look out the window from the train and know whether he should return home or not. A couple of days later, this young man is on the train heading north. An older kind lady sat to his left and he didn't have the courage to look, so he asked if she would look for him. So they came around the bend and she could see the home and the barn. And the kind lady said, you asked for a bed sheet on the clothesline? Nervous and trembling, the young man said, yes, ma'am. Honey, she replied, I think you better look for yourself. The young man, afraid, picked up his head, looked out the window and he didn't see a sheet on the clothesline. He saw the entire clothesline covered in pure white sheets. The barn was covered in pure white sheets. The porch was covered with pure white sheets. And the old flagpole had a white sheet flying high in the wind. And the old lady said, what does that mean? The young man said, I'm forgiven. I'm allowed to come home. The son couldn't contain himself out of relief. He bawled his eyes out all the way to the station. It's a beautiful story. This is how God feels about you. He's waving that white, pure sheet saying, come on home. Though your sins were red as scarlet, they are white as snow, as the word says. There is no one too far gone, no one too hard for God to save. Nothing is impossible for him. This is the disposition that we should have with our neighbors and our community, and this is how God feels about you. Let's pray. Let's look at our own heart, our own life, because there could be someone in this room today who never felt like they could come home. Maybe mom and dad, maybe friends, maybe a church made you feel like you can't change, you're hopeless, there's no way that you would be welcomed back, and that's just so far from the truth. The key is, is that you truly must turn back to God. You must truly realize and see that you need the forgiveness of God to change your life. Because they did in these stories, and Jesus saw that happen over and over again, and so have we today. And if that's you, I just wanna encourage you to come back to him right now. If you're online or in this room, would you just talk to him? Because he forgives you. He's a loving father with his arms wide open. And would you ask him, he actually already, he already wants you back, but you can ask him, take me home. And he does. Forgive me, God, of my sins. I repent. I turn away from my past life, my current life, the wicked things I've done. I'm sorry. And I come back to you and I ask you to change my heart from the inside out. And I commit my life to follow you all the days of my life. Say a prayer like that from your heart. Mean it and confess it with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior and you will be saved, the word says. And we want to help you. 
So if, if you came with someone and you pray this prayer today, we want to know and we want to help you. And if you're online, the same thing, let us know. Let's pray as a church. God, we thank you for the work you're doing today. Thank you for showing us the Father's love, your love for us. Lord, thank you that when we were sorry and repented, we came back and we found your mercy. And God, we thank you that you're honest with us and you tell us not to return. And we ask God for your Holy Spirit to empower us and enable us to walk the life that you've called us to walk, to live with two feet in the love of God. Lord, I pray that we would repent and turn away from having one foot in the world and and one foot in relationship with you, God, that we would be solely surrendered to you, that we wouldn't have two masters or two lords, that just, just Jesus would be, only Jesus would be our Lord and Savior and that we serve him. And if that's you today and you're praying for salvation and forgiveness, pray that same prayer as well, that I will serve Jesus, I will follow him only and nothing else, not even myself, I will follow Jesus as my Lord. And God, as a church, we check ourselves. We check our hearts. We, tr- we check our own lives because we don't want to be like the critical brother. God, you loved us and you saved us and we don't want to forget that. And Lord, I pray that as we go out into this community, that Lord, you give us eyes and hearts to move like Jesus did, to minister to people, And Lord, we begin to pray even right now for those who we're gonna invite to our play as we set the table for them to dine on this amazing story. Lord, for you to to save these souls, these lives, our friends. And Lord, I pray you would use that play, God. And Lord, may we be committed to help people follow you. God, we're sorry for our critical hearts. We're sorry if we've been judgmental. And Lord, help us to have the love that you have for others. And Lord, for those in this room who feel shamed and ashamed for what they did in the past, I pray, God, you would remove that right now in Jesus' name. You release them, that they would receive forgiveness once and for all, that they are forgiven. And Lord, that they would even see themselves as pure and clean as that white sheet with no stains on it of the past. They're a brand new creation in Christ. The old is gone, the word says, the new has come. Lord, I pray that they would feel that and know that, believe it today. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen, amen. Let's give God glory and praise for what he's doing today. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord.